Welcome to the meeting Anuye Stick 2021 with this lecture name, The Lasting Value of the Internet Principle, Current Impact, which is delivered by one of the fathers of the internet, Dr. Victor Gray Surf, and the co-founder and leader of the Internet Project 2 in Mexico, Dr. Alejandro Pisantin Barros. Dr. Victor Gray Surf, he's American, he's considered one of the fathers of the internet. He is, he is a mathematics and computer science graduate from Stanford University. He carried on a research about a protocol for packet network interconnection and co-designed TCP IP protocol switch. He worked at Defend Advanced Research Project Agency from 1973 to 1982. He financed different groups to develop TCP IP, the package radio network, Atlantic Packet Satellite Network, and technology for security package. He led the MCI Mail Engineering, the first ever commercial email services connected to internet. Currently, he's the World Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist of Google. He's a member of the International Advisor Panel of the Centro Cultural Internacional Oscar Neymar de Aviles, Asturias. Welcome, Dr. Alejandro Pisanti Barros. He's a professor at the Faculty of Chemistry from UNAM. He currently presides the Sociedad Internet de Mexico. He has been a member of the Executive Committee at Inca, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers where he was a vice president for six years. He's an active member of the team work for internet governance at ON. The same ON, he's also a member of the advisory panel about internet governance. In addition to the academic and international work, he has done consulting work on internet, distant education and information technology. He's an active participant about communicating these topics in social medias, where he could lead the campaign called Internet Necessario in 2009. He has participated in the decision, research, and carry out of the project and institutional leadership during almost all his professional career path. Welcome, Dr. Alejandro Pisante Barros. Please go ahead with your lecture. We have that recording and then I will go to QuickTime and I will do a screen recording. Record entire screen, start recording. And then I will come back and go to full screen. Okay, in estos momentos está el video ya. All right, we are recording in both modes. Excellent. I'm just making sure I have my conversation guide with me in, in more than one format as well. Um, so, Vincer, it's uh, such an honor and such a pleasure to, to be able to speak with you. Uh, the over the years we have uh, been able to, to to ask you lots of times what is really the internet and this is not a rhetorical question we have uh, engaged in this conversation in some very critical fora before the UN before governments before uh, law enforcement authorities before uh, social media firms asking not only what is the internet but what if you tweak or do some things that are being proposed, but you still have an internet. That's what made us uh, ask really the, in, in depth, what is the internet? What are, what are its most essential properties? And where would you lose them? And also because people use the name the internet for so many different things. If you ask uh, traditional uh, original IETF engineers, they will tell you one thing and if you ask kids 13 years old they will tell you something completely different which would probably say geez that's not the internet that's something someone is doing with someone else using the internet so I I'm moving if we can start either with uh, your brief definition for what is the internet or dive into the importance and endurance of the design principles of the internet. Well, I think the design principles actually uh, help you understand what the internet is and what it isn't. Uh, in the, at the core of all of this, 
is a computer communication system. It's a system designed to allow programmable devices to exchange information with each other. It's a system that allows multiple networks using different technologies to become interconnected with each other on a global scale. Uh, in the current internet, there are some 76,000 networks that are all interconnected. They're all independently operated. That's an important part of the design, allowing this independence to happen. The operators of each of those networks decide who they connect with and on what terms and conditions. The technical functionality of the basic internet is kind of like uh, electronic postcards. If you think of the packets of the internet at the internet layer of protocol, as postcards, you practically know everything there is to know about the internet because postcards get lost and postcards uh, get out of order. Um, in the internet, sometimes these electric, electronic postcards get duplicated because we retransmit knowing that there might be some loss. Um, and so that's the, basically it's an electronic postcard system that runs 100 million times faster than the post office does. But that's just sort of the core. Now, the fact is that it's a best efforts communication system. There are no guarantees, just like the post office. But in order to improve the quality of work, we put layers of other functionality on top of that basic little postcard mechanism. One of those is called the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP. And it functions in the same way that you would if you were sending a book to someone through a postal system that had only postcards available. And so you have to tear the pages out, cut them up and fit them on the postcards. Then you know, oh, some of these are going to get out of order. So you better number them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, because some of them won't have page number because you cut it up. Then you know that you might lose some. So you keep copies in, in case you have to resend them. Uh, then you kind of wonder, well, how do I know if I need to resend something? And you have this brilliant idea. Well, I'll have my friend send me a postcard saying I got, you know, all the postcards up to number 420. And then you realize that postcard might get lost. And so you wonder what to do. And then you say, okay, well, I'll check my watch or I'll check my calendar. And if I haven't heard anything back from my friend, I'll start sending copies until I finally get that postcard. And then you think, okay, there's only one other little problem. Imagine, uh, again, in this metaphor, that you have a thousand page book and you cut it up into 2000 postcards and you take it to the post office and uh, and you hand all 2000 postcards to the post office and by a miracle they deliver all 2000 postcards to your friend at the same time except his post box will only hold 200 postcards and so the rest of them blow away or the dog eats them or something so then you have a deal with your friend i won't send more than 200 postcards at a time until i get back a note from you saying you got them all that's called flow control well, basically, that's how the internet works. It's basic TCP IP protocol. So that's a simple conceptual thing. And we've maintained this end-to-end -end capability. You put a postcard in and it comes out the other side without any change. That's an essential functionality. The second thing is that anybody who wants to send a postcard is allowed to send one to anybody else. Third, uh, it allowed for an addressing structure that let any computer anywhere on any network send something to any computer on any other network that's part of the app. Two other factors which are very important uh, and are related to our postcard analogy. The first thing is that the packets of the internet don't know how they're being carried. So they don't care whether it's over a radio or an optical fiber or a coaxial cable or something else. Or a pigeon. It, that, yes, exactly. So it, it doesn't care and that's important. It's ignorant of what the underlying transmission medium is, and that means that if a new medium comes along, the basic internet postcard layer doesn't care. It just sweeps, uh, sweeps it in underneath as another bearing capability. The second thing, which is related to postcards, is that just like a postcard doesn't know what you wrote on it, the internet packet has no idea what it's carrying, except it's a bag of bits. That turns out to be important because it's interpreting the bits that produces the applications that are on the internet. And that work is done at the edges of the net by what we call the host computers. And that means that if you invent a new application which uses the bits differently, the internet doesn't know anything about it because it doesn't care. So we can keep inventing new applications. And as long as the underlying system has the capacity to deliver postcards at the right rate, uh, then you can do almost anything you can figure out how to program, which is why we're doing what we are doing right this moment on the internet in real time with relatively high bandwidth video going back and forth 
and audio as well. So those are, are very essential elements. And I, uh, let me ask you, Alex, whether you would add to that list some other features. I know one of them you might put on would be permissionless innovation, where you're free to try things out on the net. It's open. Try out new protocols at different layers in the architecture. Try out new applications. There aren't any, any rules other than following the protocols or inventing new ones somewhere in the hierarchy to support a new application. Is there anything else you would add to that? Well, for me, it was a revelation when in, in, in a very in-depth conversation, you uh, arrived at uh, pointing that it was uh, best effort and not interoperability that went first in these principles. There's a hierarchy of these design principles and you would rather keep uh, best effort fallibility of the networks as an assumption than any other ones as the founding assumption. And, you know, that turns out to be an item of real controversy today. If we look at some of the telecommunication systems of the past and the future and the present, uh, we'll see enormous focus of attention on quality of service in the telephone system. A great deal of effort is paid to signal to noise ratio. Uh, low latency and things of that kind to allow these kinds of interactions to take place. I point out, we are doing exactly that with a best efforts communication system right now. And so, so maybe this focus of attention on QoS may not be nearly as uh, necessary as some people thought. There are current and future communication systems like 5G and 6G, which are radio based. They're used to support mobile uh, telecommunications and the 5G and 6G designs have an element in them which refocuses attention again on quality of service, slicing of network uh, capabilities in different ways in order to serve different applications. And I will submit to you that I still believe that the attempt to parse uh, and, and to um, design different uh, functionalities is less attractive than having a general purpose system, which as you know, has grown by a factor of one to 10 million in every dimension, speed, number of devices, number of networks and so on. Uh, it's just grown, uh, uh, shown capability to grow very, very uh, significantly with the same architecture. Um, I'm, I'm going to use your mention of 5G and 6G. To, to ask you a question I had planned for closer to the end, but it will, I think it will shed light on, on, on the importance of these principles and their, their immense repercussions. Uh, are there ways in which 5G or 6G can break the internet? Uh, well, and perhaps uh, if, it, if it turns out, for example, that uh, not all parties observe exactly the same control interface into the 5G and probably the 6G network, uh, then, you know, then you have, you know, a, a failed connection. It's like the railroad becomes together like this. Um, so everybody has to implement exactly the same functionality or you may not have commonality. That's true for the internet too. I mean, if you don't yep. build the same protocols, the things may not work. But the slicing, for example. Yeah, well, slicing is, is intended to give what I guess is, is um, a dis different design points, different service points. Uh, on the 5G network, different data rates, for example, or maybe different latencies. Uh, but one thing I have uh, discovered very quickly in the best efforts world is that as soon as you tried to put quality of service into the best efforts environment, it wasn't clear how to get that to work uh, beyond possibly two networks agreeing with each other to implement some interface that, that produces a certain quality of service. But as soon as you stick a third internet in between or a third network in between, how do you get everybody to agree to, you have an N squared problem of agreements uh, to uh, support that? In the end, it just doesn't work. And you, you wind up with best effort being the best option for you. So I am uh, continue to be skeptical about this over attention uh, to uh, the type of service and quality of service and slicing of the services up. This isn't to say it won't work and it isn't even to say that there won't be cases where that's actually quite useful probably within a network, uh, I could understand that. Looks more like an end of the street kind of network. Yes, for than example. Than a network that's going to be traversed. And 
I, I, by, I, by the way, I, one other interesting uh, thing to observe about how the internet has been used is that um, some of the applications uh, would like to have low latency, for example. And so the people who populate the internet with applications have built what are called content distribution networks. All that means is that hosts that contain, for example, video are co-located with the ISPs, the internet service providers that are serving in, uh, specific customers. So it might be a, um, uh, tele a, a, a video cable system that's also offering internet service in its uh, head end might be a server, which will also deliver streaming video, or in a telephone service in the central office, there may be a server which will deliver streaming video. So you push the video or other popular content, web pages and things like that, out to the edges and closer to the users, that gives you the lower latency. That's another way of achieving the objective without having to uh, attempt to do end-to-end -end, uh, low latency or end-to-end -end quality of service. And it still is more flexible, more scalable, and uh, less expensive in the end, more robust. Well, uh, certainly I think so, but then I'm biased. Yeah, but, well, the fact is that there are more CDNs being built and dedicated links for, for, for video to the home. We're, we're seeing a similar thing happen uh, with the cloud-based systems, which is an evolution, uh, which probably was predictable because in the earliest days of the internet, it was all about connecting time-shared machines on uh, local networks to each other through the wide area system. Today, what we see are, are uh, data centers that are connected to each other by uh, networks into a cloud of computing capability. And of course, we have multiple clouds like Google's cloud and Amazon's cloud and Microsoft's cloud and so on. Um, and what, you, what we are seeing from the cloud providers is an effort to build networks of two kinds. One, to link all the data centers together so that they can share information and computing power, replicate information to keep anything from being lost. Those are very high speed networks. Ours run at somewhere between 400 and 800 gigabits per second per channel in the optical fiber backbone network that connects our data centers together. And then there is another network, at least in Google's case, which connects to the public internet. And that network has peering connections with virtually all, almost all of those 76,000 networks that are out there for the purpose of quickly moving a user from their local ISP into the super high-speed access network, which leads into the Google Cloud uh, services. So again, we're seeing that, um, I would say, evolution of the architecture of the internet in order to meet the demands that customers have for high capacity communication for high power and expandable computing uh, and, uh, and low latency. Uh, your, uh, your audio is off. Yeah, I'm trying to isolate from the Mexico City uh, street noise, which is delightful, but <laughs> we do a little bit of color. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll just edit this part, not to worry. So, um, do you fear that, you know, what, what you described, I see it as a Google or Facebook or Microsoft, so, you know, all the large uh, multiple service providers uh, building a backplane that's globally extended and there you want full control of your fiber. Um, but does that run the risk of creating single or highly concentrated points of failure? Well, potentially, yes. Uh, we saw one happen uh, not too long ago where a misconfiguration in the border gateway protocol uh, at Facebook led to the isolation of Facebook system from the rest of the internet. Uh, and it was it was very dramatic. It went away for some number of hours. Um, but uh, but that isolated a particular service from the rest of it didn't didn't hurt the rest of the internet. Yeah, it's not the internet that was cut off. Uh, right. It, it it actually isolated um, Facebook's internal network from the rest of the internet. So uh, and I don't mean to pick on Facebook, by the way. Everybody can make mistakes like that. Uh, I'm. Some people worry that, uh, that that somehow there is this big concentration, but to be quite honest with you, uh, there is a concentration of computing capability and applications from these various big providers. And why do they get big? Well, the first one is that their applications are attractive. 
And the second one is there's an economy of scale, especially on the data center side. You build a bigger data center and it costs you less in terms of you know, people to manage increasingly large data centers because so much of it is automated. But that doesn't stop anybody else from building comparable kinds of things. And I think that if you look at the history of the application world on the internet, you see some very popular systems come and go. Uh, I guess maybe Yahoo would be an example of that or AOL. So um, although there is expressed concern about uh, the very large hyperscalers, they call that nothing in my experience says that there won't be other hyperscalers coming along that will scale up as a consequence of the economy of scale. So I'm not I'm not so worried that this creates a big hazard for for the internet because most of those hyperscale networks are uh, are associated with particular cloud service, and if, if the cloud service goes away, it doesn't make the internet go away. It just makes that particular service go away. Ram, yep. And also, there's this layering of platforms where you actually don't have to. Uh, worry that much about competing with a present platform, but like being creative on top of it, which leads us to developing countries, uh, smaller economies where, uh, like ours, where we have uh, a number of universities and people working in them, and they can actually concentrate on being innovative on where there's still an open field instead of trying to outcompete an incumbent for uh, uh, with a very high barrier. So, Alex, actually, your your question makes me think again, though, there is an issue here, and it's one that you and I both worry about, and that's this increased dependency on technology in all forms. But the very specific thing is that some of the hyperscale uh, servers or services have an extremely broad uh, range of application, and people become very much dependent on them. And so when those go away, Lots of other things, it's like a cascade failure. Lots of things that were relying on some application or other offered by one of the hyperscalers. If lots of people were relying on that for operating their business, staying in touch with their friends, doing medical remote consultation and so on, if that goes away, there are impacts, there are side effects. And so reliability uh, is an extremely important component. The more we depend on these things, and so here I have to agree with you, not to put words in your mouth, that reliability uh, is increasingly important. And uh, I think we need to focus attention on that because the side effect of the failure is dramatic. A good example of this uh, is a problem that occurred in the United States. There was a ransomware attack against Colonial Pipeline. Colonial Pipeline shut down because it wasn't able to operate because of the loss of information in its uh, now encrypted data centers. And uh, the side effect of not being able to move gasoline to places where it was needed caused a massive cascade failure. So uh, it's not just uh, in the networking world that we worry about these things, it's the interdependency of everything that creates vulnerability. And we should all be thinking, how do I reduce that vulnerability? And what's the best way to do that? Risk management should be a more and more essential part of education at earlier and earlier levels, right? Yes, really good point. Uh, and, uh, going back to the slicing thing and to the quality of service, uh, is there also a risk of violating uh, layer separation, doing, trying to fix problems by crossing layers and also, you know, regulating hate speech by closing up endpoints? Yeah, well, you, you made, made several points. I'm going to unpack them for just a second. First of all, uh, I have to admit that I used to be rather purist about the layering and, you know, uh, this is a layer violation, red flag. Uh, I am somewhat less uh, purist about this because sometimes information coming from the lower layers can inform the upper layers how to behave and how to make use of maybe the available resources. What if they if those lower level resources are diminished for whatever reason, you may want to adjust the encoding schemes or change the way in which the application interacts with the user. But your other point uh, I resonate with very strongly, and that's an attempt to solve a particular problem at the wrong layer in the architecture is extremely harmful because of overkill in effect uh, or overreach. So deciding that hate speech is a problem, which it is, 
and then deciding to turn off the internet uh, because of that denies access to all of the beneficial uh, capabilities that the internet has offered and will offer in the future. So figuring out how to adjust the response in, to uh, the appropriate uh, location and the architecture is important. You and I use the word subsidiarity for that, to say focus the attention where it is best exercised in order to cope with the problem. Right, and uh, excellent. It's always illuminating to, to, to hear you speak to me from, from this uh, layered experience. Um, uh, Vint, permissionless innovation, any thoughts? Well, the first thing which uh, I feel very strongly about is that uh, we don't know how to do everything. We only know how to do some things. And the only way to learn new things is to try things out. And, you know, it's one thing to do paper design. It's something else to go build something to see what happens. And so I am a huge fan of hands-on, try stuff out, learn from it. We certainly learned when we built the first version of the internet and we knew we discovered we got the protocol wrong and we went through four iterations before we got that done. We're on our seventh iteration in the interplanetary internet. So, um, so this idea of, of being able to try things out without having to get permission from everybody is important. Imagine, for example, that uh, if you were providing uh, a service uh, to the community that's on the internet, and let's say you're located in Mexico City uh, and you have an ISP that is serving your uh, uh, application, supporting your application. Imagine if you had to negotiate with all 76,000 internet service providers that make up the whole internet before you could offer any service on the internet. That's, it you know, would simply stop anyone dead in their tracks. So permissionless innovation is an important notion especially if you want to be able to potentially reach everyone on the internet with your new idea. And so I could not overemphasize the importance of supporting permissionless innovation. Now, this doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some guardrails and rules. Uh, if you decide you want to innovate by essentially providing a denial of service attack engine as a service, uh, somebody should raise their hand and say, excuse me, that's not a service that we want to see happen, and there's good reason for that. And if you put that up, there may be consequences. And certainly, the innovations are made somewhere by someone, and the laws still apply. It's not uh, the law of the jungle or the wild west, right? Uh, well, it, some people see the internet as a kind of wild west um, because it, there hasn't been very much pushback on trying things out. And there are people who do harmful things on the net. You and I both know that. You know, denial of service attacks, malware distribution, ransomware, and many other things, bullying. And true crime, um, I mean. And, and, you know, there's a long list. And that's our challenge in some sense in this whole discussion. How do we preserve all of the value that the internet has already demonstrated and is capable of delivering in the future while protecting people from potential harm? And you can see governments recognizing that that's a problem and then attempting to respond. And the problem is sometimes their responses are not well informed with regard to the architecture of the internet and the mechanisms that are available for coping with harmful behavior. Uh, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Antonio Guterres, has uh, asked for and has recommended a, an effort to grow digital cooperation uh, across the world among the various countries of the world in order to respond to the need to identify people who are doing harmful things to others who may be in a different jurisdiction. And so we only could track down these harmful uh, actors uh, if we can cooperate across international boundaries. One very important trend there is that we more and more you you taught this uh, you taught me this uh, the internet has is increasingly becoming a mirror of humankind. Of course, it's kind of a distorted mirror, so some some ugly things are amplified. Some nice things have initially been very much in the focus and sort of been marginalized, at least from public attention. Uh, but one of the things that we realize is that most of the say evil or the malfeasance uh, still comes from people or 
organizations, criminal organizations or governments whose policies are not necessarily most democratic. Uh, we've sort of been discussing a framework to, to map these things. Uh, where do you see this evolving? So this is such a, a meaty and hard question, uh, but thank you for bringing it up because it's central to the future of the internet in my opinion. So the first thing I would observe is that when uh, we saw the opportunity for commercialization of the internet, which came kind of late in its story, I mean, it was 15 years into it from 1983 to 19, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm saying that wrong actually, now that I think about it. The internet was turned on, well, it was designed in 1973, developed until it was turned on in 83, the first commercialization comes around 1988 or 89. So that's 15 years from my point of view, uh, perhaps only six years from the point of view of actually turning it on. Um, but what, what I think was uh, important about all this is that um, we were trying to lower the barrier for the ability to share information, computing resources to discover information. And of course, as the World Wide Web arrived in the early 1990s, and people discover ease of sharing information, an avalanche of content flowed into the net, which actually drove the need for indexing and search engines and things like that, hence organizations like Google and Yahoo and Bing and so on, or, or services like those. Um, but that, that lowering of the barrier lowered the barrier for everybody, including people who didn't have your best interests at heart. The thing which I believe is the most dramatic about the internet and the social networking that has come along with it is the amplification effect that the internet introduced. And so this, this notion of lowering barriers had a beneficial opportunity, uh, created beneficial opportunity, but it also created the opportunity for amplification. The ease with which you could reach literally a global population without having to own a newspaper or a radio station or a television station uh, meant that uh, harmful behaviors get amplified potentially. And so that's a little, that's new. The, the ability to get a megaphone without much cost to you uh, is important. We see this in the form of spam, in the form of email that you didn't want that shows up because somebody could easily send it because it's almost free except on your end, it costs you a lot to try to filter it out or to go through it manually and throw it away. So the amplifier effect here, I think is an important one. And I don't think we fully come to grips with this, but it teaches me that as a technologist that I need to talk to and learn from sociologists, psychologists, neuroscientists, economists, legislators, uh, as well as my technical colleagues in order to understand the environment that this artificial environment that we've created. And so we have a lot of work to do to understand this ecosystem, which is filled with very, very dynamic components. Audio. Uh, Vint, what's the largest, let's say, favorable surprise and the nastiest one that uh, have come over the years after you know, what, what you designed and started operating? Well, the, the most favorable result, I think, is thanks to Tim Berners-Lee and his invention of the World Wide Web and a new layer protocol we call HTTP. Uh, the ease with which people are now able to create information uh, and to share it with others is pretty astonishing. We have to give some credit to Steve Jobs for inventing a mobile phone that has a camera in it and a radio in it and, they, and is accessible to the internet. Those two technologies are mutually reinforcing. The mobile smartphone, it makes it possible to get to the internet in more, uh, more easily than you could otherwise. And of course, the internet makes the mobile phone or the smartphone more useful because of all the content on the internet and all the applications you can build. There must be or, or on the order of Two million applications available on smartphones. Uh, of course, most people probably use a very small fraction of any one of them. So those were huge positive impacts uh, on the internet. Uh, the the negative impacts, uh, of course, come uh, right along with all of that, uh, and that's the bad behaviors that are reinforced 
by the power of amplification, uh, by the um, ease with which people can share uh, misinformation and disinformation. During this past uh, couple of years of the pandemic, uh, we've seen an enormous amount of disinformation, some of it for political reasons, some of it for reasons I don't even understand, that have tried to drive people away from getting vaccinations, for example. We've also seen political interference, uh, certainly in the American elections in 2016 and 2020, and perhaps in the future as well. So we need to figure out how to cope with that. And it's not purely a technology problem, uh, which is fortunate, speaking as an engineer, uh, because I wouldn't want to be responsible for solving all of that problem. It feels like it, it needs additional uh, uh, input from people whose expertise is well outside of the technical realm. We argue the, the Internet's Newton, Einstein, uh, yes. the Internet's Edison, or... Uh, well... Uh, no, that's, that's, did you, did, did, did yes. you get the physics? Did you get the, the, the engineering? Did you get the business started? Um, first of all, I'm not the only. Or who is? Uh, well, first of all, Bob Kahn is the guy that should get the credit for even thinking of this. He was the one who came to me and said, I have a problem. Uh, I need to figure out how to connect these different kinds of nets together for the Defense Department, thinking about command and control and using computers in that context. So uh, I, I, it's not like I woke up one morning with this brilliant idea. It was more like, hey, I have a problem. Can you help me solve it? And Bob and I are smart enough to know that if you want to solve really hard problems, you go find other people who are even smarter than you are to help you. And then you have to convince them they want to do that. So that my job was selling other people on wanting to help us solve this problem and to find ways of making it useful. So I don't think I'm any of those famous people that you mentioned. Uh, I'm just an engineer like all other engineers who love solving problems and get very excited about the possibilities that lie ahead if you can just figure out how to program it. That's great. Uh, Vince, what's your greatest concern for the future of the internet? I think that my big worry you touched on earlier, and that's recognizing some of the hazards of the online environment, whether it's dependence on it when it doesn't work or if it doesn't work, uh, or the harmful behaviors that we see uh, some of the, uh, you know, denial of service attacks and the spread of malware and the, uh, the stealing of identity, uh, all of those various things, or the spread of misinformation and disinformation. We see all those harmful possibilities. Uh, and I worry that those will become so uh, a focus of so much attention that it will, the value of the internet will be abandoned or that people will forget that its utility is far more positive than all the negative things that have been going on. It doesn't mean that we can ignore those negative things, but we certainly don't want to lose the potential of the internet. We're back to permissionless innovation and my belief that only a small percentage of all the potential of the internet has been realized as people begin to discover what they can do with it. And as the underlying infrastructure improves our ability to do those things, we could not do this kind of video conferencing in the earliest days of the internet, but we tried. We tried. You did have a plan. Uh, we Well, I don't know whether it was a plan, but we certainly thought this would be useful. Certainly think about it in command and control. You need voice, video, and data. Uh, and so we tried, but we didn't have enough capacity. Well, along comes optical fiber networks running at now at 400 to 800 gigabits per second per channel. Uh, suddenly we can do all of this stuff. So trying things out and discovering, you know, how far you still have to go in order to make them work uh, is part of the fun of, of that uh, innovation adventure. And I believe that there is still plenty more to do if we uh, avoid the possibility that we torpedo the Internet's uh, essential uh, uh, features uh, or essential principles in the in a misgotten attempt to solve the, some of the hard problems that we are worried about thanks that's uh, an extremely powerful message that i think we should amplify uh two very quick uh questions to to finalize one of them uh it's often said that security was an afterthought 
in the design of the internet. We've talked uh, extensively about this. Can, 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 can you give a soundbite for this? Yeah, this? Thank you so much. I don't know if I can do a soundbite on this. The, the simple answer is no. Security was known to be a very important issue in the original design of the internet. We were doing this for the American Defense Department. We certainly anticipated that they would require security. Uh, and in fact, I started work literally almost uh, coterminously starting in 1975 with the American National Security Agency to do the development of packet cryptography in order to support end-to-end uh, -end cryptography on the internet. I was aided in this, uh, not to say that I was alone in it, but we were aided in this by the development of public key crypto, which came along at least in uh, principle in 1976 when Marty Hillman and uh, Whitfield, Whitfield Diffie published a paper on new directions in cryptography, but there were no implementations. And what I concluded after uh, looking at, at that was that this could be retrofitted into the internet. And indeed it has been in many different ways. We, we, we use cryptography in different layers in the architecture for different purposes, whether it's strong authentication or confidentiality. And uh, I believed at the time that because it could be retrofitted, that we didn't have to interfere with our effort to demonstrate that the basic internet design was functional and was workable and could achieve its objectives. So I let, I let that be an, uh, not an afterthought, but a uh, sort of a post-production uh, kind of, uh, of implementation. We still have a long ways to go. We still have work to do to make the network more secure. A very important point, which I didn't make very clearly earlier, is that uh, the Basic internet, the communication system is, is the smallest part of this iceberg that we, that we call the internet. It's all of the applications, the data centers, the devices that we use, the internet of things, the smart appliances. They're all part of this thing that most people think of as the internet, not just the underlying transmission system. And it's important to make that distinction because a lot of the problems are up here uh, at the top. Uh, of that uh, architecture, or if we use the iceberg uh, analogy, the problem is <laughs> down below the level of the visibility. So um, anyway, I, I, I think uh, security is something that is top of mind, and it's going to require cooperation of the general public as well as uh, the private sector and government. You and I need to learn how to be, uh, how to exercise what we'll call uh, a security hygiene. And we should be using two-factor authentication. Uh, we should be careful about uh, changing passwords if, if we're using those. I'd love to get past the point where we don't need passwords anymore. We use alternative methods. But there are lots of things that you and I need to do. Don't click on phishing email. Don't download pieces of software whose origin you don't know anything about. So we need to learn how to, this is called digital literacy, and it's important for us to introduce that into the equation. In the message for universities, for CIOs, for presidents? Uh, well, for, first, let me beg the universities that support research to pay some attention to the following problem. We've been programming, uh, speaking generally, for over 80 years. Not me personally, but you know the community of computer scientists. And none of us have learned how to write software that doesn't have bugs. And the consequence of that is that buggy software is exploited by smart people to do all kinds of bad things in the uh, digital world, not just the online world. I would, um, I would really appreciate it if the research world would find ways of, of creating software development environments that expose the mistakes before we push them out the door and tell us, by the way, you've made the following error. I have to tell you that most of the mistakes are frankly stupid mistakes. They're oversights. And I, I'm fond of believing that most serious programmers have a little dent in their foreheads from the many times when they've gone, oh, how could I possibly have done that stupid thing? So we need help on the research side to build uh, programming environments that expose the mistakes that we've made. The other thing we need to worry about is open source software, which is wonderful, it's lovely, isn't it great that people share what they've done with everyone else, except the assumption that because it's open source, that means all the bugs have been found is wrong, because everybody makes the assumption that everybody else already looked for the bugs so nobody bothers. The result is open source software is often more buggy than anything. 
So we need to pay attention to that. To harvest the value of open source, we also need to expend serious effort to clear up the bugs that are in those open source libraries. Those are extremely valuable insights. Uh, I hope they get heard widely. And, you know, uh, speaking uh, more broadly than the, just the technical things that I've mentioned, uh, we've already uncovered that the internet is an extremely complex ecosystem, which has, you know, has economic and social and uh, you know, psychological aspects to it in addition to its technology. So that means the universities need to draw on talent from many different disciplines in order to understand the nature of this complicated beast and how we can make it more safe, more secure, and more useful. Thank you, Vin. This has been fascinating. I think it's, uh, it will take days only to, 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 to take notes of what, uh, what you've uh, given us. It's, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful. I'm sure I'm, I'm representing many in thanking you for, for, for this conversation and for all these insights. Well, it's, uh, it's I who should be thanking you, uh, partly because you ask such thought-provoking questions. You plainly put a lot of work into that. Uh, and second, of course, you uh, made your own significant contributions to this whole story uh, as vice chairman of ICANN and as CIO at UNAM and in your subsequent writings. And so let me thank you for all that you've contributed and that I am sure you will contribute as this system continues to evolve into the future. Thanks, Vin. That's, that, that's too much. That's not, uh, at all available. Thanks a lot. Okay, so I will stop the two recordings that we have going. I want to pray that both of them work. This one says the, there. We have that recording and then I will go to QuickTime. Bueno, queremos resaltar que esta conferencia ha sido muy enriquecedora para los participantes. Nos hacen, nos hacen llegar dos preguntas para usted, eh, doctor Alejandro. La primera es, ¿qué opina del futuro del Internet interplanetaria? He hablado mucho de este tema con el doctor Serf. Es eh, muy impresionante porque al principio esto parecía algo eh, totalmente imaginario. Pero resultan varias cosas interesantes. Por ejemplo, cuando se tienen numerosos objetos creados por seres humanos, es decir, satélites, naves, como los llamemos, dispositivos en el espacio, que están haciendo transmisiones de comunicaciones y a su vez las requieren eh, para control, etc. Eh, a veces quedan detrás de, de cuerpos celestes, quedan fuera del alcance. Entonces realmente sí se necesita un mecanismo de interconexión, es una especie de mesh en el espacio. Las condiciones de diseño para esa red eh, obligan a modificar importantemente los protocolos, por ejemplo, los times to leave, los tiempos de transmisión, pueden ser realmente prolongados y las tasas de transmisión, los bit rates o las anchuras de banda son bajísimas. Todos los protocolos tienen que ser, por un lado, muy robustos y por otro lado, muy económicos. Entonces, nos obligan a recurrir a este principio, cuando vemos como el principio de robustez de postel, de ser eh, generosos con lo que se recibe, interpretarlo tan tan, tan cuidadosamente como se pueda con poca información y por otra parte dice generosos con lo que se recibe y parcos con lo que se envía cada bit que se envía al espacio o, o que se quiere que una nave envíe desde el espacio tiene que tener una justificación y eso ha obligado a una revisión de los protocolos de internet terrestres también, y es el trabajo que hace el doctor Ser con el Jet Proportion Laboratory en California Excelente, muchas gracias nuestra segunda pregunta es ¿Cuál debe ser el papel de las universidades para continuar este camino hacia el Internet del futuro? El primero, eh, le pregunté eso, como ustedes pudieron ver al, al final, al doctor Ser, y él nos dice que el, su principal preocupación está en el software. Eh, Internet, después de todo, fue desde su principio un proyecto de software, un proyecto fuertemente basado en software, dependiente de software. Eh, utilizaron computadoras que ya existían, computadoras relativamente genéricas, las famosas. PDPs, y eh, sobre ellas con software hicieron eh, todos los protocolos y todos los experimentos y luego las eh, instalaciones de Internet. Solo después aparecieron compañías como eh, Wolverine y Newman, BBN, o como Cisco, que fueron creadas ya para, para hacer hardware para estos fines. 
Eh, entonces, el tema es software. Y el mensaje que nos dio al final el doctor Seth, cuando le pedí un mensaje para las universidades es, concéntrense en formas de producir software que no contenga errores. Es decir, de evitar los errores desde el principio, de detectarlos antes de que sean cometidos. Como él mismo decía, muchos de los errores que se cometen en software, que son los que crean las vulnerabilidades, no son errores maliciosos ni errores muy graves, sino producto de descuidos. Eh, él mismo decía, está seguro que los programadores tienen un chichón en la frente o una cicatriz en la frente, la cantidad de veces que se han golpeado diciendo cómo pude cometer ese error. Ese es el mayor mensaje. El mío, además, es concentrémonos mucho en entender muy bien los principios básicos de esta tecnología. ¿Por qué es tan importante? Por ejemplo, como, como nos lo transmitió el doctor Serf, el principio de eh, el, el, la, la hipótesis, digamos, de diseño, de falibilidad en la red, lo que conocemos nosotros, traducimos nosotros como el principio de mejor esfuerzo. Es más importante incluso en la jerarquía de los principios de diseño que el de interoperabilidad, que es el que siempre nosotros manejamos en estos cursos como lo más importante, o el de apertura. Todos ellos sirven a esta red de mejor esfuerzo. Y eso quiere decir también que cuando miremos hacia 5G o lo que en Estados Unidos empieza a hablar de 6G, nos preocupemos de preservar los, las propiedades de Internet. Mucha de esta conversación con el doctor Ser viene de muchos años de estar en distintos organismos internacionales y sectoriales discutiendo con gente que quiere arreglar Internet de una manera o de otra, pero que descompondría Internet en su conjunto, es decir, nos quitaría la interoperabilidad, la volvería eh, una intranet, por ejemplo, para volverla más segura, o la volvería una red de broadcast en vez de una red de, de pares para transmitir mejor el video, para controlar mejor los contenidos. Entonces la pregunta es, ¿qué le puedes quitar a Internet? ¿Qué principios puedes violar sin que deje de ser Internet? Y bueno, la respuesta ha sido este condensado que nos dio hoy el doctor Sergio. Espero que les haya servido a, a muchos de sus participantes. Muchas de las discusiones que tenemos de política pública con temas como neutralidad de la red, o bloqueo y filtrado, o discurso de odio, o discurso de polarización, o desinformación en redes sociales, tienen remedios en la capa adecuada, en el cruce de capas, como lo dijo el doctor Sergio. Si bien ya no es tan, tan riguroso en su punto de vista al respecto, tan purista, sigue siendo algo muy importante de, de evitar, hay que atacar los problemas en su capa, porque cuando te brincas las capas, empiezas a crear otros problemas, si sí, no es que estén prohibidos las cosas de capas, pero cada cosa de capas que hagas tiene que tener un... Y mirando cuando dicen el futuro de Internet, pensando en redes de 5G, por ejemplo, que están por implantadas en muchos países, estas redes son sumamente importantes, y tenemos que tener mucho cuidado de distinguir lo que es una red 5G, por ejemplo, al interior de una instalación, en el, digamos, prácticamente como parte de una intranet, de lo que es como parte de internet. Lo mismo con internet de las cosas. Cuando hablamos de internet de las cosas a nivel industrial, hablamos de sensores y actuadores mediados por la nube. Es muy distinto eh, del, de lo que vemos eh, cuando pensamos en los relojitos para contar pasos, los dispositivos caseros de vigilancia, etc. Es decir, internet de las cosas de consumidor. Y tenemos que tener en cuenta entonces este ecosistema complejísimo siempre con base en, en buenos principios de diseño y estos objetivos, este, el objetivo que nunca se esperaron cumplir los diseñadores de Internet, esto lo hemos platicado a lo largo de muchos años, fue que alcanzara la escalabilidad que tuvo, la arquitectura está tan bien pensada, que su escalabilidad ha sido impresionante, y aunque ha habido cambios, por ejemplo, en el protocolo IP versión 6, pues la, la retal se ha mantenido, ha sido enormemente productiva, entonces tener eso en cuenta, una formación muy robusta en matemáticas, en ciencias de la computación, en programación, para construir ese futuro desde las universidades. Ok, thank you. Well, we want to thank you, Dr. Victor Braiserf and Dr. Alejandro Pisanti Varge, for having given this excellent lecture. And let me inform you that your statement of participation will be sent in a very short time. And finally, thanks to everyone who joined us in this lecture. Good morning. En nombre del doctor Serf, les transmito saludos y un gran agradecimiento. Que tenga mucho éxito este trabajo de, de Arnu y Esti, que es un grupo muy, muy importante que viene a nacer y empezar a crecer. Me parece extremadamente importante su labor y los felicito por, por, por llevarla a cabo siempre más eh, agresivamente en el sentido tecnológico y en el sentido de servicio a la comunidad. Thank you, Mr. Alejandro Pisantri.